Hi guys, I am here to uh, continue our book, The Collectors, and we're going to work on chapter three today. All right, I hope you guys are enjoying it. I think it's kind of a good book. So here we go. Chapter three, Van couldn't quite remember his father, so he imagined him instead. Your father was a magic worker, said his mother, or his mother would say, whenever Van asked about him. For years, Van had pictured his father wearing long silk cape and a shiny top hat flourishing decks of cards and making rabbits disappear in little puffs of smoke. Eventually, he realized that this wasn't what his mo mother meant. In fact, his father was a stage des designer. His name was Antonio Felipe Gauguez Garcia, and he created the kind of special effects with light and fabric and shadows and dry ice that made audiences gasp. As far as Van knew, he was still out there somewhere. <clears throat> possibly in some Europe, busy European city, sketching scenery and hanging strange contraptions from flying rods. If Van had ever missed his father, he couldn't remember that either. But he had inherited something from him, something besides his dark hair and eyes and, his, and parts of his too long name, a model stage. His mother had been about to get rid of it, According to her, there was no point in saving a bunch of bulky things when you were going to move again in six months. So she always was throwing things out and Van was always rescuing them from the about to be thrown out pile. And the model stage was especially worth saving. It had a black wooden floor with one foot deep and two feet wide and black velvet walls around the back and sides and a fancy gold proscenium with red curtains that opened and closed when you pulled a cord. It was the perfect size for Van's collection. That evening, as soon as he and his mother got back into their current apartment, Van scurried through the kitchen, down the narrow hallway, and into his bedroom. He closed the door behind him. He took off his hearing aids and set them down in their spot on the bedside table. Van usually took the hearing aids off as soon as he was home for the day. Removing them felt like he was having a big broom whisked through his head, sweeping out all the dirt and clutter away. Now he could focus on more important things. Van hurried across the room and knelt down in front of the miniature stage. He tugged a very a heavy plastic box out from under his bed. Inside the box were hundreds of small things, things that other people had lost, dropped, thrown away, or forgotten, and that Van had found, picked up, cleaned off, and saved. There were tiny plastic swords and paper umbrellas from sidewalk cafes. There were miniature animals and cups and cars and broken jewelry and tokens from board games. There was a tin soldier he found on the London underground and a tiny stone frog he'd sat on in a German train and a three-legged lion from a public bathroom somewhere in Aust Austria. Van had been going to a lot of places. Most of them were a blur. London was a big grayish blur. Paris was a big ivory blur. Rome was a big sunny blur, except for the objects that he collected. Though these stood out in his mind like rubber ducks floating in a big blurry sea. Now Van took the red plastic spaceman out of his pocket and added him to the box. He dug around until he found a miniature mirror and an old egg cup. He balanced the mirror on the cup and placed it in the center of the miniature stage where it looked like a little bit of a fountain. There were a few plastic trees in the box and Van had set up these around the stage's edge. He didn't have any squirrels in his collection, but there were two cats and one of them was white with a plummy tail. It was close enough. Van examined a few dolls, but they were all too poofy and princessy to be the girl in the big coat. He thought about using one of the plastic army men or the little statue of a saint he had found on the sidewalk in Buenos Aires. But in the end, he settled on a wooden pawn from a chess set. It wasn't right for the strange girl, but it was the only thing that didn't feel wrong. The role of Van would, would be played, as always, by a little plastic superhero in a black cape, Super Van. Van set the cat squirrel next to the fountain. He scattered a few of his foreign coins over the top of his, the miniature mirror. Then he posed the pawn beside it. The pawn leaned in to grab a coin. Super Van strode onto the scene, 
You know, you really shouldn't take those, Supervan said boldly. They are people's wishes. Instead of whirling around, splashing the squirrel and shoving Van backwards with a wet pointed finger, the, van, the pawn bowed its knobby head. Oh, pawn girl said, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I just need the money so much. What do you need money for? asked Supervan. Are you hungry? Do you need help? Yes, said Pawn Girl. Yes, please, I'm so hungry. Wait right here, commanded Supervan. And with Supervan in his fist, Van dug through his treasure box. He found a set of beautiful plastic fruits he'd almost stepped on in a part park in Tokyo, and a little silver goblet that probably once belonged to a little silver king, and a pizza and a hamburger and several other miniature snacks that were actually erasers. Look out below, shouted Supervan, and he soared over the stage, dropping food like edible bombs. Pond Girl and the squirrel cheered. You saved me, cried Pond Girl, as Supervan landed gracefully on top of the fountain. I'll never forget you. What's your name so that I can find you again? You can, you can call me Supervan, and what's your name? I'm... Van paused, twirling his little, twirling the little wooden piece around his fingers. What was the right sort of name for a girl who wandered city parks with a too long coat and a noisy squirrel on her shoulder? He thought about the names of the girls at school and at his last school and the school before that. None of them seemed quite right. In fact, there was no ordinary name that he could think of that would suit this strange squirrel-wearing girl. He was still twirling the little pawn back and forth when his bedroom door swung open. Van smelled his mother's lily perfume just before she touched, touched his shoulder. Playing with your marquee? she asked. Van's mother liked to call things by their fanciest names. The little stage was a marquee. The movie theater was a cinema. Coffee with milk was cafe au lait. Van's mother was never in the bathroom. She was indisposed. Kind of, said Van. I just realized that I forgot one of our errands today, said his mother, swishing away and sitting on the edge of Van's bed. Van followed her with his eyes. We should have picked up a birthday present for Peter Gray. Van gave a little jerk. His elbow bumped the stage. Super Van toppled into the fountain. Why do we need to get a birthday present for Peter Gray? Because you're going to his party on Saturday, I told you about this. Ingrid Markson looked into Van's wild eyes. I thought I told you about this. He invited you weeks ago. He invited me? Well, Charles invited you on Peter's half, behalf. Who's Charles? Mr. Gray, his mother smiled brightly. He has a first name, you know. Mr. Gray was the artistic director of the opera company that had hired Van's mother for a season. Van knew he was important. Mr. Gray obviously knew it too. He always wore a suit and he always spoke with a British accent that Van thought might be fake. And he always seemed a little bored with everything happening around him. His son Peter was just the same, minus the suit and accent. Do I have to go, Van asked. His mother leaned back on the bed and patted her upswept hair. Do you really need to ask that question? Van set the pawn on the stage. No. I'll pick up a gift for Peter tomorrow, his mother said. Van looked up at her face again. She rose from the bed, stretching languidly. There are plenty of leftovers from Leo's in the refrigerator if you're hungry. His mother signed the last word as she spoke it, cupping one hand and moving it down toward her vest, her chest. Her mother always spoke aloud when she signed, which wasn't very often. Van had been almost five years old when his mother noticed the trouble he had with his hearing. Since then, besides getting the little blue hearing aids, he had become an expert watcher and sound follower. While Van thought it might have been cool to use a secret silent language with his hands, there was really only his mother to use it with. She didn't do anything silently. Okay, said Van, and his mother swept out the door. A minute later, Van caught the faint trickling hum that meant his mother was in the living room at the living room piano. The clear, higher, the higher, clearer hum of her singing followed it. Her voice glided up the scale 
like a paintbrush moving across a campus or canvas, its colors fading out onto the edges where the notes grew too high for Van's ears to catch. Van pushed his door shut. Then he knelt down in front of the little stage and picked up Super Van and the Pond Girl. But now, for some reason, he couldn't think of anything to make them say. He set them down again and picked up the cat squirrel instead. Quick, 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 it said. Van set it back down again. He let out a heavy sigh. At the moment, Van would have rather been headed to the bottom of a scummy park fountain than to Peter Gray's birthday party, but he didn't have a choice. Okay, so that's chapter three. So we'll um, work on chapter four in just a minute. Thanks.